Stream production has increased almost close to 12 lakh ton. Our export market has increased almost like uh, 1.5 million ton. Our, uh, of course, uh, Honorable Prime Minister has given target for us 1 lakh crores as a foreign exchange. We are uh, almost crossed 60, 63,000 crores. Uh, production, uh, I mean, 5 lakh, um, 5, 5, 5 ton per hectare we need to achieve. Yes, we are close to 33.5 or 4 in some area. Uh, there are some uh, almost like 65, 70 schemes we implemented through Pradhan Matri Matsampadi Yojana. It's a flagship program from the Prime Minister and our Atma Nirbhar package. So there are many schemes which are really working well. There are few are there, yes, uh, there is some uh, small, small gaps. We are working on that. By considering all these things, uh, today's Indian fisheries in comes to uh, coastal states, northeastern states, uh, our Himalayan states and inland states. It may be uh, cage culture in the marine system, cage culture in the reservoir system, uh, ornamental fish, seaweed, domestic consumption, international market, disease management. By considering all aspects of Indian fisheries, infrastructure development, government of India has taken a lot of initiatives. It's giving, uh, start giving results. Maybe in another uh, one and a half or two years, uh, definitely we'll achieve whatever the target Honorable Prime Minister has given. With this uh, uh, opening remarks and context, so I request uh, first speaker today, there's a little change in the uh, 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 speaker list, uh, request Dr. V. Krupa, uh, Member Secretary, Coastal Aquaculture Authority, so who is going to speak on uh, uh, fisheries and aquaculture avenues for uh, uh, sustainable livelihood generation, supply of dietary protein. Uh, since she's having a flight at 7 o'clock, we just asked her to present as the first speaker. Uh, Dr. Kupa? Thank you. Thank you, Murthy ji. Uh, respected Sagar Mayara, sir, other dignitaries, and uh, respected uh, Lakra, sir, uh, and uh, a very, can I, what can I say, good evening to all the members who are present here representing DOF and the uh, industry. I'll just uh, quickly go, uh, go through a small presentation which I have prepared for this. Uh, as you all know, uh, the total uh, global production, fisheries production was about 214 million tons in 2020. Of that, capture fisheries was 90.3 million tons, and aquaculture contributed about 122.6 million tons. And the interesting fact is that 91.6 of this came from Asia. And just imagine, it had about there were about 58.5 million people employed in the primary sector, and in the secondary sector, 600 million livelihoods were involved in this. Overall, women constituted about 21%. So this is how the sector is uh, important globally and how it is important for Asia and uh, for India also, it is very important. This picture just shows that in 1995, the number of fish farmers in India were 16 lakh and they formed 13% of the global total, okay, 107. By 2005, the number of fish farmers increased to 27 lakh and they contributed 17%. By 2019, the number of fish farmers will be more actually, it will be 50, it is recorded as 55 lakhs contributing to 25%, just imagine 25% of the global total. So this is how our workforce has been increasing. One interesting factor here is that in China, though the production has increased, the number of livelihood is Namaste, sir. Should I stop? Yes, sir, can continue. No, no, it's okay. No, okay. You continue. No, I'll just welcome. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Dilip Kumar Sab, uh, Pitamaha of uh, Indian Fisheries, a former Vice Chancellor. Uh, Central Institute of Physics Education. Thank you very much, sir, for attending this one. Thank you. Please continue. Uh, so this is how the livelihoods are, uh, are, uh, have been progressing over the years. Uh, now, there is a big uh, confusion on, on the statistics. Okay, it says that 34% of uh, female 
that is the women employment in processing is higher uh, in the processing sector but actually it is much more so there is a, we have to but the fao statistics gives more importance to processing actually in the aquaculture sector if you look into the indian scenario there are many people involved women involved involved in the pond maintenance daily feeding cage men, uh, cage fabrication and mending all these are not recorded at all so if you take the indian scenario the number of people involved and that too women employ, employed in this sector will be much higher than reported in the fao statistics now in 2022 the uh, in, from the aquaculture si sector uh, there was about uh, 10 10 lakh uh, uh, tons of uh, shrimp production of which 96 percentage was elvanami and the uh, 4 percentage was uh, monodot all the other resources which i have shown below are uh, I have started growing uh, in in the sector that that is uh, technology adoption has taken place but it has not come to a level of uh, even 1 percentage now we have uh, the department of fisheries Im is implementing a program which is called the pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana and the main people who are involved here are uh, murthy garu and uh, sagar, sagar mera sir all or and the entire team at the dof and nfdp are promoting fisheries and aquaculture they are giving fund through the pmmsy for uh, development of infrastructure for uh, all other activities so uh, this all this you can get more details from the website nfdb website which is uh, given in very uh, detail uh, i am not because only 15 minutes so i am not going to deal much on this and and few more points i have to tell this because this is an important factor where the country has been marching forward in many states you must be knowing that there was no fisheries minister at all now in uh, uh, by february march we had the summer meet in mahabalipuram where uh, ministers of fisheries from all states had come they were so impressed by the pm msy that i i felt really proud that i am part of uh, this uh, uh, dof team now so uh, so the the main there are about seven main points for pm msy enhancement of fish production productivity modernizing and strengthening doubling fish farmers income enhancing contribution social physical and economic security robust fisheries management and all these things are there as a part of the pm msy now what i'll just focus on see it on the aquaculture diversification because that is something which the country needs uh, if you look at the statistics as i said uh, we can see only contribution from the shrimp farming sector though there are other sectors also developing now seaweed farming is has grown Uh, very uh, has has had a very significant growth during the last five six years, especially along Tamil Nadu coast. And there are many people who have uh, earned a livelihood, and the families have also uh, <clears throat> that economic statistics also has improved for the families uh, during the last five years, especially through kappa figus farming. So this is something which has been uh, progressing, uh, and the uh, and all states in Tamil Nadu. there are many uh, programs for promoting seaweed farming for uh, uh, for example there is uh, there is going to be uh, uh, the one of the major problems is the shortage of uh, the seed material so they are going to develop uh, a park for um, uh, getting the uh, um, uh, seed material so many things are there happening in the um, uh, seaweed sector and one one important factor which the industry also felt in one of the conferences uh, which they voiced is that we in india do not use any seaweed as a salad item we don't use it for cooking all the seaweed which is taken is uh, mainly for raw material i think we should change uh, if you look in the korean food or chinese food or whatever in other south east asian country the seaweed forms a major part of uh, the uh, uh, daily diet whereas we depend only on on uh, other uh, greener green items so it is time we change slowly to making a uh, uh, seaweed like the species called the alva um, all this can be uh, included in our diet uh, so this is something which uh, people are working on 
and uh, this is a sector where i speak more for women because i have found that women need more employment uh, in the sector that is very important so that is why i thought this slide should be there so uh, uh, they right now seaweed farming is done by women so why can't we think of uh, greater opportunities in the secondary sector why can't there be more processing units headed by women seed materials developed by women and more production units so just a slide to show that and uh, the second important point is the bivalve and oyster mussel farming why i kept this slide is that because this is a food item which is very rich in um, uh, protein and especially the omega 3 fatty acid is very Uh, rich uh, in almost all minor uh, minerals so it, it is a, it is recommended uh, to be as a health diet in us but only thing is it, the quality that which reaches the table should be of high standard consumer confidence should be there if we farm it in dirty waters or the polluted water that will be reflected in the product but there are i'm very happy to say that there are many so many self help groups in kerala and and maharashtra who are doing this but the industry has to support has to grow we can have a, a good market for live uh, oyster live oyster which was uh, uh, priced at only just 1 rupees is more than 200 rupees right now in kerala so this is something uh, where the processing industry and the seafood exporters also can develop from the farming Uh, produce for uh, bivalve farming there are some bottlenecks one is that the seed is uh, mainly taken from the environment this has to change the bivalve farming hatchery the bivalve hatchery technology is there uh, with the cmfra uh, at william center they have producing but we should have more hatcheries so that uh, the hatcheries can supply seed to uh, the farmers post harvest is a very important factor it's not like shrimp you cannot just directly sell the product after it is farmed it has to be depurated and then so many processes have to be done before it is marketed so and market promotion to build um, bring in uh, for confidence is also required so processing industry can benefit from this uh, uh, technology mud crab farming here i should say uh, empedas rgca is doing a very good job they are supplying seed to the farmers this is taken up by the uh, uh, mangrove uh, unit of uh, maharashtra also so this is an activity which can be carried out almost in all states where there are good mangroves and fin fish culture has developed so much now really uh, i think uh, it is uh, people are thinking of uh, having a, a, a fin fish pond and then a shrimp pond in some areas because they, uh, where the market is good domestic market is good so there are many species uh, uh, which are uh, which are uh, preferred by the um, uh, um, uh, coastal uh, area farmers uh, mostly the atropus um cobia and um, uh, so many other species these are uh, sea bass grouper all these technologies are there small cages can be uh, grouped uh, can be uh, erected and it is uh, seasonal farming it will not it is not there for year round so environmental impact also is negligible and the way forward is that strength is that we have extensive brackish water area and then brood stock and uh, hatchery nursery techniques are available aqua inputs also av available and the very important point is that under pmms5 lot of support is given to brood bank development as well as cage farm cages to erect the cages and for nurseries also so these are things which can be taken up by the uh, farmers and the industry can also develop along with that that is the post harvest uh, uh, sector marine ornamental uh, there are more than uh, i think uh, 15 16 species which are which have been domesticated because this is one issue which has been plaguing the industry because they take the uh, ornamentals right from the coral reef area this is not allowed but there are technologies for farming uh, clownfishes damsels 
even for sea anemones there are uh, uh, technologies so uh, in in ramna district there are uh, there were uh, i don't know whether they are right there now also there are uh, there were self help groups who were doing uh, uh, ornamental fish breeding and they were selling it the international demand for marine ornamental is so high and the opportunity for us being a uh, um, uh, with uh, with a lot of international terminals uh, in uh, throughout uh, the coastline i think uh, the country can take really good advantage of these um, uh, positive points and go ahead and develop a good ornamental fish industry in india as well as uh, uh, the supply to the international market now these are the technologies avail available but can you do farming anywhere wherever you want actually it is not possible in india if you uh, globally if you see the uh, uh, market demands uh, or prefers a product which is well regulated mpda people are there they know the trouble that we are going through to uh, uh, to uh, inform the world that we are regulated but there were so many loopholes we have tried to solve it now in 2005 the coastal aquaculture authority was formed that was the authority was formed mainly to regulate the coastal aquaculture activities which were till then uh, 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 were giving lot of negative impact to the environment but after the authority was formed the farms were asked and all the farmers were asked to register then uh, um, uh, it became uh, elvanami was uh, uh, permitted elvanami is actually uh, exotic species uh, farming was uh, uh, permitted then ca role increased okay then 2019 the department of fisheries was formed and then Uh, in 2020 22 under the ease of doing business caa developed uh, amended the rules everything the rule registration process was simplified then in 2023 i should say the entire act was amended so now we have a well regulated system till now this, uh, all this uh, other aquaculture activities which i showed were not permitted but on one side we were promoting on other side as per the act it was not it was prohibited but now the department of fisheries and the ministry has supported the um, um, amendment and we have now this uh, act amended this is the growth production which i am sure everybody on all of you know and this is the farm registration uh, one thing you have to know it notice is that most of the farmers are uh, small farmers <coughs> and it is not done by ca alone we have about 71 collectors and other officials helping us out there are regulations in place we are uh, we make sure that the environment is protected the eco the uh, ecologically sensitive areas are not hampered and this is to show the growth of uh, the farms along the uh, uh, coast during the last uh, 15 years and uh, oris uh, andhra pradesh is the topmost followed by orissa uh, this i am skipping through because there will not be time Uh, uh and this is a slide which shows the potential which we have for development uh i think all of us should join together and see that this we we improve upon the area farm it should not be 1.8 it should be at least uh, uh five more than 5 hectare lakh hectares to be uh, farmed and this is a seed production which ca is controlling with a very strict uh, uh, this thing like uh, and uh, we have about uh, one one good thing uh, recent uh, development is that we have marine fin fish hatcheries also uh, in india now there are about three marine fin fish hatcher seed production units and you can see that our seed production capacity is so high that uh, we can supply uh, even if more area comes into farming the we have the potential to develop and this is just uh, to show that we are going uh, uh, with the time changing times and we have uh, uh, giving the digital certificates to the farmers there is a strong aqua aquatic quarantine system uh, uh, headed by uh, no the um, uh, Uh, which is managed by rgca under the empeda and the caa uh, also looks after the activities this make sure that only good quality seed um, uh, uh, broodstock comes to the hatcheries and the farmers also get good quality seed 
and uh, the input uh, is uh, that is all these things like uh, what can I say adult feed, adult uh, mushroom feed, larval feed, probiotics all these things are certified by the CAA as antibiotic free. So far we have about 17 states um, are involved in production about 4600 units are there and uh, CAA is uh, keeping a close watch on violations. This is this I have just kept to, to uh, inform you that we are regulating and the act has made us stronger and we are, are uh, being, uh, the antibiotic issue will be given more focus in the coming years. This is just to show that we have lot of uh, strengths, good connectivity, financial support, uh, the skill development program, technology for advanced training, uh, spatial planning is very important. For all that, we have so many technologies uh, which can be used directly for aquaculture development and uh, diversification, as I said. This is a summary of uh, the uh, avenue, which is uh, uh, the opportunities which are there with us for development. And uh, that's all from uh, CAA under the Department of Fisheries. Thank you so much for the patient hearing. And uh, if there are some questions, I'll take it. Thank you. This one. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. It's a very informative uh, talk. Uh, since uh, she is leaving, so any questions is there, we can take up one or two. So remaining, we'll take up at last. Mike is there? Somebody is there? Anything? Recent CA amendment, anything is there, so she is there. She will answer the thing. Yeah, please. So then, shut the mic. Uh, heavy metals in, uh, in seaweeds. Uh, marine food products. Oh. Okay. Uh, shall I answer? Yeah. You are for no, no, yeah, yeah. It's my subject. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The PhD topic of. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, heavy metals, I think uh, you are talking about arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. These four are uh, thing. Even uh, European uh, uh, Union also. Very particular about these four metals. Okay. So as far as your freshwater fishes are concerned, uh, so it is not uh, th that much. Okay. There is nothing like alarm situation. But when it comes to cephalophores like cuttlefish, squid, octopus, whatever we call, in that are muscles, in the, even in seaweeds. Basically, seaweeds are called biomonitors. So if you can just uh, take the seaweeds and just test for these metals, you will understand the coastal area of that particular area. Okay. Really, whether it's polluted or in industry effluent or anything like that. But uh, when it comes to the domestic market and international market, there is already importing countries requirements are there. So all these products, whether it is uh, Middle East, whether it is a European country or any other country, so they will have their own thing. So we will test that particular thing. After that only it is allowed to export. So uh, even uh, you know that, I mean most of the, uh, these are the products, edible part only will go for test. If you take uh, liver, pancreas, kidney, I mean vital part of the, any organism, accumulation is more. So if you take this part, you will get uh, accumulation more. But when it comes to edible part, muscle, flesh, so it is not much. Yes, few are rejections are there, but uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, regulations already implemented through MPDA, Export Inspection Council and all those things. At present, it is not like anything alarming. Okay, any publication, anything is required, I can share with you. Already we have published many papers in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kupa. Moment, yeah. I request uh, our uh, Joint Secretary, so Mr. Sagar Meraji, to hand over one momento to our uh, speaker, Dr. Krupa. Yeah. You come to the end, man. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. So next speaker, I request uh, Dr. Uh, W.S. Lakra, former Vice Chancellor, uh, Central Institute of Fisheries Education. So, sir, uh, actually, uh, 
uh, is going to speak about uh, blue revolution and, and uh, impact on Indian uh, fishery sector. So you know, I think Sir was in charge uh, for this blue revolution. Uh, so after his, uh, I mean, uh, CFE tenure, so he has, I mean, framed uh, many guidelines for the blue revolution. He's going to speak. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening, and at the outset, let me thank the Ministry, Ministry of Fisheries, uh, Marasab, for inviting me to this uh, mega event. And uh, well, when we entered the Pagati Maidan, it's obviously a mega structure. And then we, we have to learn about the whole, whole new setup now. I could witness something when in the morning when we heard the Honorable Prime Minister you know, inaugurating this. Uh, on the dais, we have respected Dr. Dilip Kumarji. I would say, I always say he's my elder brother and a world renowned fishery scientist. We have just heard Kripaji the, from the authority, uh, Murtiji, the, the CEO of the NFDB now, our friend from the industry, Jagdishji, Kartikanji, the director from MPDA, and uh, all the esteemed, you know, participant, delegates, invitees, uh, the Fisheries Development Commissioner. Uh, well, uh, I would be, when you speak, you know, on fisheries and aquaculture in a, in a group like this, and we have a number of speakers, uh, we all speak almost on the same things. Uh, so <laughs> it's good that I'm number two. Had I been number four or five, maybe there would have been nothing left for me to speak. And that's how that we, we always, you know, face this, this problem. But then there's always something to, uh, carry forward. Well, when we talk about the food system, the, we are talking, we are meeting at the World Food, you know, event. Uh, discussion about agriculture is very important. And since I represent the National Academy of Agriculture Sciences now, uh, recently we had a 16th Agriculture Science Congress in uh, Kochi. It was again a huge mega event. So, in agriculture, you all know that green revolution, the food grains is now 330 million tons. We are, we are the largest milk producer, fisheries production now, Kripaji had just mentioned. Pulse, we are making strides in pulse production. Our sugar production is also rising. And then the horticulture, we are number two in agriculture, in fruits and vegetables and then cotton with the BT cotton, you know. So these are all our strength now. The country is moving forward and to, to realize this uh, vision in 2004-7, that India has to become a developed nation and the third largest economy, we are fifth now. So I think we have to look at agriculture and agriculture will definitely play a significant role in the years to come. Uh, well, if you look at the UN vision also, we have to address zero hunger. I think that's a second challenge. I don't have to 
tell this this slide because we all know this is basically for people who are from non fishery sector i don't think it is our internal group if there is somebody from non fishery sector then this is our resource such a huge resource we have in this country as far as fisheries is concerned and then our production has gone something around 16 million tons plus second largest global fish producer second largest aquaculture producer fourth top capture fisheries producer then the growth is from 8 to 10% in fisheries and aquaculture and then our uh, exports to the tune of uh, 63000 and of course which contributes to more than 15% again the blue revolution scheme you all are aware about this but then this flagship program of the government of india has played such a impactful role in the country is the integrated development of all inland and marine fisheries and during the past a decade or so we are all witnessing such a wonderful growth in the sector all whether you look at the infrastructure or look at the production in the inland sector aquaculture or marine i mean in every sector this scheme has brought a sea change and thanks to the ministry mera saab to spearheading this this particular pradhan mantri sampada yojana in the country now again we look at the strength of our fishery strength we look at the biodiversity we have so when we are aiming to be a global leader a developed nation the our investors our the foreign partners should also know that we have such a huge strength in terms of aquatic biodiversity is more than 3500 species we have and all across from cold water from himalayan streams to the fresh water to brackish water to the marine so such a diverse aquatic resource only few countries have and this is our again our strength and in addition to fish you have all other kinds of invertebrates uh just now we heard that the inland sector the genetic resource we have for the inland sector is mostly now you know controlled by the three indian major carps though we claim that we have developed technology for about 25 30 odd species for the freshwater sector but then they have not come into the system to the level which they should have been so that's again a challenge but then opportunity also not for only us but for anybody interested in freshwater aquaculture in this country and uh, we have now information on the genetic stocks of a most of these species we know that which stock is better in terms of its, its you know growth traits so those informations are available now and they are being used for developing improved strains for a number of species and uh, some of these species exotic species like tilapia and pangaea is also have become the choice species for freshwater fish farming inland saline sector is another important resource in this country and uh, it's more than 9 million hectares of the saline soils in states like haryana and punjab and the technology has been developed by one of our institute dr dilip marji was also heading before me uh, and uh, our rohtak center and the technology has been now taken up by the farmers in punjab and haryana and they are doing uh, shrimp farming in these inland states to the large extent uh brackish water uh, we just heard about brackish water but then i would just like to emphasize that the we are only using a limited resource we are not using the entire resource only 10% is being used for brackish water farming and uh, of course uh, there is huge potential for both species and the uh, system diversification in the brackish water farming and if we can if we can enlarge this i think we can bring a lot of change similarly for cold water species we have the golden marshy or snow trout and exotic trout you know this is again a, a resource which has not been tapped properly of course we have a cold water fishery institute and our himalayan states are working but then this has immense potential to 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 tap reservoirs are 
we always say that there are sleeping joints and yes when we talk about future potential in fisheries i think we always talk about reservoirs and the deep sea resources so reservoirs is another another area which can invite lot of investment whether case farming or other, otherwise and this is one resource which has immense potential mary culture mary culture is uh, one area uh, dr kripa mentioned and our institute in kochi simafara has been doing lot of work but then again we have not gone to a very commercial level we have developed technologies for number of species and those species uh, are being cultured along the coastline but then if you look at this projection if you can use only say about 1% over the coastline that comes to 82 say square kilometers if you can use only that much you can look at the kind of production we can have in the years to come so again the focus is on mariculture and it can invite lot of you know interest and, and, and investments in several areas whether it is developing uh, brood brood banks breeding technologies for commercial species or 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 the actual farming along the coastline so this has again a huge potential in the years to come so these are the species which have been currently you know uh, cultured or experimented cobia sea bass groupers mullets lobsters and in the coastal states and our institute in kochi is doing this work seaweed i will not touch only ms kripa has already mentioned but i would just say that we have more than 700 species recently at the academy we conducting a brainstorming session and then those uh, uh, the proceedings are to be brought out now if anybody is interested can contact me we will share those proceedings of seaweed farming uh, in the country the products which 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 we can have from seaweeds ornamental again uh, uh, it has been just discussed so uh, i would just say that this resource has again not been not been you know utilized a country like indonesia can have such a huge or singapore uh, india with such a huge resource i think we also need investment in this sector research part is fine it's okay we're developing technologies but then on a commercial scale farming on a commercial scale is yet to be i think realized in our country so species the kind of variety we have i think when we when we share this with our uh, colleagues from abroad they all get excited about the species the ornamentals you know both freshwater and marine modern science is another strength of of this country now mainly our icr institutes are doing lot of research you know uh, from genetics to genomics and uh, the whole genome sequence of about uh, eight species has already been completed by our uh, our icr institutes barcoding of more than 800 species you know it's all global reports and global leads in fact in in these areas and then uh, but then how to use these genomics data information towards our fisheries management and fisheries de development remains elusive you know and that's that's the challenge for 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 the future then cell culture system now globally people are talking about in vitro meat production so that is uh, another area which is picking up and in us at least two companies have got some license you know to produce a, a in vitro meat so we have also started working on in vitro meat production in vitro fish fish uh, you know uh, production using cell lines you know muscle cell lines so these are the current excitements in modern science and in the country and in addition to gene editing i think uh, i was listening in the morning that japan is the focus country for this world food uh, you know event so i don't see anybody from japan here but then japan is the first country who has produced two gene edited fish and uh, so that's the another area probably uh, have collaboration with japan government and japan institutions in area of gene editing and we are, we are working on crops you know rice and <coughs> um, um, crop species and this again of course uh, uh, is discussed at the highest level but maybe in the years to come this is another potential area probably for global collaboration and partnership biodiversity we all know challenges you know exotic species and coastal marine resources conservation protected areas and uh, and uh, ranching how to enhance the our uh, 
uh, natural fisheries, you know, a lot of ranching is being done, but then I would request uh, Mana Sahib here, he's sitting here now. So when we discuss about ranching, uh, people ask, well, what is the policy for ranching? Is there any policy in the government of India for ranching? We have the guidelines, but we don't have a policy as such uh, how the ranching should be done in different river systems or natural water bodies. So the blue economy uh, is another, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, oceans being the center of, you know, approach and we are also undergoing through the uh, ocean decade now. So the ocean decade is currently from 2021 to 2030. There are global events on oceans. So th that is another important because oceans have vast resources. And in future when we say that the water is becoming very scarce, water will not be available for inland aquaculture and inland farming. So maybe we look at the sea and sea, our sea is a wealth, you know both in terms of minerals or fisheries or water, uh, you, you, you name anything, I think we have that. So uh, when I, when, uh, if I have students here, you know, I would urge the students to read this book, The Blue Economy, uh, 10 years, 100 innovations, 100 million uh, jobs is by Gundra Pauli. This is the book I always uh, tell students to read this particular book about blue economy, I think that's very important. Global partnership. When we say global partnership, Marasa, I'll just finish in two, three minutes. I know you're looking at the watch. And uh, funding opportunities. I mentioned about the resource we have. So when we have the resource, so we have opportunities for funding, uh, both in fisheries and aquaculture development. We have highly specialized organizations. Only few countries have such, such resource-specific organizations, both under the ICR and the Government of India and the Ministry of Fisheries. Very specific organizations. So that's our strength. Why Green Revolution was possible in this country? If you look at the father of Green Revolution those days, he said, uh, why it was not possible in Africa? Because parallelly there were efforts both in Africa and in Asia and in India. He said because the institutional strength. We had institutions like IRI, which were not there elsewhere. So we have strength in terms of our fishery research institutes and other departments. So for a global partnership, global collaborations, I think the strength can play an important role. And then of course, our human resource development, exchange of students, you know, we have fisheries universities and the central sector and the state universities like this. So again, on the policy print, you know, aquaculture, and fisheries improvements, we, of course, governance and policy reforms. Dilip Kumar Saab is here, you know. He, he did a lot of hard work in preparing policy documents for the government of India. I don't know what is the status now, but then we all, we draft policies were there. And we, we were reading and he had a lot of consultations and meetings. So I hope that they will, they will come out finally. So I think that that's something we have. So the way forward, which I would say for our entire sector is, we have to look at sustainable aquaculture intensification and expansion, both. Whether, whether it is horizontal expansion or vertical uh, you know, intensification. Sustainable. Then effective management of all fisheries. All, every resource has to be effectively managed. Then improved value chains of aquatic food systems. I think that's again very important. And then finally, if you all work hard and collaborate and have partnership with central and state departments or Indian and foreign departments or foreign partnership. I think we can transform Indian fisheries with cutting edge research, innovative technologies, and of course, including our global partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. As usual, uh, very effective and informative, insightful uh, presentation. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. Uh, so now, we'll, uh, question and answer will take up uh, later, uh, the last. So now I request uh, Dr. Dilip Kumar, uh, former Vice Chancellor, uh, Central Institute of Fisheries Education. He's going to speak on aquatic food system and its role in uh, global food and nutritional security. Sir. Thank you.
hang on, yeah. Cursor so. is not working. So. Excuse me. Cursor can make a rise. Thank you, Dr. Murthy sir. Uh, Honorable Joint Secretary, I see a big transformation. He came as a bureaucrat, but now he is a fully, uh, I think that we see, empowered technocrat. So that's really just we, we appreciate. Uh, earlier also, just we had uh, Mr. Tarun Sridhar sir, so he is now he is completely, fully technocrat, so it's uh, good for us that we are getting such people to uh, manage our sector. Uh, but uh, I would like to say Dr. Lakra Sahib, from we worked for quite a long time together, and uh, I think uh, before CIFE also, earlier also just we have worked together. And uh, he has done many things that we see really that has transformed, especially in genetics. He has contributed that people will still uh, remember. And only thing may there there are many things that we see he has given the direction so people can follow that one. And uh, we have all our um, Dr. Kripa is there. She is uh, well known earlier from the very, and she has earlier also contributed to this uh, uh, Coastal Aquaculture Authority. And I'm very happy that you see our people, this is required that we should have a connect between uh, development and research. If you are able to do, we can really just see do wonders. And this is, these are some of the examples that, that we see. Uh, um, also, we'd like to uh, see that we have our fisheries development commissioner. Oh, what? Oh, oh, already retired. Okay, I was thinking that you are quite young. Okay, so and then we have colleagues here uh, from. Uh, I'm very happy to see that we have also from industry and now also uh, from from the sector, those who are involved in management, all of you are here. <laughs> and uh, I am really grateful to Mera Sahib, I, I could receive his uh, letter, inviting me to come participate and given this opportunity yeah. so that we can interact. <laughs> uh, well, <coughs> I, will, I will touch something that is not really macro, and at the same time, this is not micro, but in between, that you see how the sector is moving, really what are the priorities or some of the challenges are there, and how we should address them, move forward with that. So one thing we must realize that food, now it is food and nutrition, because food, concept of food is gone, Simply, if you are going to have carbohydrates, it is not going to help. Earlier, India was known for a uh, carbohydrate-producing uh, country. So we want to have, uh, for the human development, it is required that we should have a diversified and also balanced food where we have a protein, carbohydrate, and with all diversified food systems so that just we, we, those who are producing, those who are just consuming, they have a better food quality. <coughs> so that depends upon, and that is very much important for to ensure that you see your mental health, uh, physical health, uh, and also that you see the mental capacity of absorbing, a skill development, etc. It is just to see going to, in fact, the food that you are going to consume, it is going to affect your entire lifestyle and also uh, your capacity in many ways. 
so that is important i would like to uh, say so this is one of the challenge the the biggest challenge for humanity is to provide food and nutritional security to the the eight almost eight billion people we have on earth and then they are all um, gradually increasing so so, so so i i am just going to touch something where that you see our fisheries sector is also doing but again here we should not say only fisheries and only animal husbandry or all only agriculture it requires that we all should come together and then only we can address it so uh, first of all that you see because we are from fishery sector and we are really assigned to work in this so you would like to say that aquatic foods i would like to say it is not fisheries but aquatic foods because here we have fish also we have well other that other animals also that is also considered as as, as fish in broader term it is included in the fish but uh, we have also plants different types of plants are there aquatic fruits are there and they are mm, they have also high value and 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 nutritional uh, value also and then also that you see they are very important especially in country like india where we have more than 50% are vegetarians <coughs> so <coughs> here uh, aquatic food system what we uh, we have uh, just to see we discussed this aquatic food system where we have all animals plants uh, together and but only thing is that it is grown in in water uh sorry <clears throat> and on the other side we have terrestrial food system that includes both livestock means uh, uh, animals as well as the plants like we have different crops um, food grain crops and then uh, we have uh, horticulture uh, then uh, and fruits and other things and then uh, we have live stock so it is also these two types of mainly that uh, aquatic system aquatic uh, foods and then uh, say terrestrial foods at this stage if we want to really hit on or to address the problem of food security food and nutritional security it is required that we should have a integration of both terrestrial and aquatic foods that is required so uh, long back i think uh, about 10 years or 15 years back uh, see uh, about 15 years back there was a study by by world bank and they underlined that in country like india and perhaps many other countries also Uh, we have not been able to harness the potential of complementarity between uh, between various between say uh, various system of farming so it was only about integrated farming but the same way now we it is the time has come where we must see and must ensure that you see we are able to harness the complementarity the potential of complementarity between between uh, aquatic and terrestrial between fish aquaculture like aquaculture or fisheries and then also we have uh, uh, sorry uh, this uh, fi- um, uh, agriculture crop and then also uh, the yeah, uh, animal sciences yes so we this this is required we need to have this one and this is big potential that we have not been able to harness we can discuss that you see what are the advantages <coughs> uh so uh, now uh, recently just in fishery sector we have seen that you see there are certain new visions are uh, being uh, discussed and also say we have certain um, something like a 
that is visions and all the new guidelines are also certain approaches are also coming up like one of the that you see the transformation of food system it is transfer transformation of aquatic food system transformation of terrestrial food system this is also required that is required means just they say that these are required if you are going to address the problem uh, of food and nutrition security the other one is when we come down then you discuss with uh, say you come down exclusively in aquaculture here also just we have that we need to transform aquaculture so that it is more uh, efficient it is more sustainable and and also that you see it is highly diversified so these are the transformation that aquaculture as such what we are doing no in future it requires that you see it, there should be improvement like this and then other one is one health so health of uh, animal we are or plants we are growing and also health of the environment this is very important and now they say now now it is really advanced that we should have a, a concept where concept of one health which is a really holistic approach to ensure that the food you eat that is also healthy then uh, environment is also friendly and then uh, so that there is no um, say uh, also just you can prevent many zoonotic diseases also this way so this is also one of the approach that we should go with uh this is just as you can say that by 2000 the the trend so that it is about aquaculture and fisheries also but mainly i am talking about aquaculture farming here uh it is expected by 2030 uh, we are going to provide we will have a steady growth not much of fluctuation and perhaps just to see we will be able to provide 21.5 kg of fish per capita to the people over 8 billion people of uh, the globe uh, <clears throat> and uh, say ha uh, something about the global production like uh, say in 2000 the fao i think that is within next few year uh, few months i think we will get the latest figure but now this uh, sofia 2020 uh, contains the um, say uh, statistics up to 2020 so there it shows that you see uh, the global aquaculture production reached the record of 122. 6 million tons where animal contribute means animal others are i think about 70 uh, 75 35% are 30 uh, yes 35 hmm. uh, they are uh, say plant but about uh, uh, 87.5 million tons are animals like fish uh, <clears throat> again uh, this is also that you see You see the uh, regional contribution. Ninety-one point when we are discussing about aquaculture, ninety-one point four percent, ninety-one point six percent is contributed by ex exclusively by Asia, and the rest means something like a eight percent or so uh, that come that is contributed by rest of the globe. so there i think that you see there won't be any i think everybody to agree that aquaculture is basically a asian way of farming and here it is very much well connected to the social setting of the uh, of, of the region and that is why that simply if you are going to follow what is happening in europe or in western countries if you are going to have here uh i think that you see well to certain extent to some of the uh section of the society or just farming community or business community this may help 
but overall that that won't be really acceptable widely so <clears throat> now uh, about contribution uh, if you are talking about that to see the contribution of fish in uh, for human consumption uh, the rate of growth is about 3% and while the rate of human growth is 1.3% so you see it is very much it is it is we can accept that you see this is sure to provide uh, food security uh, to the to the people of this sector <coughs> now after that just to see i am coming to that uh, there are and if we, whatever we are doing based on certain evidence uh, i would like to say certain evidence with example i would like to say there are three important area which has got huge potential for the development of aquaculture the first one is that we see complementarity integration of aquatic and uh, uh, terrestrial systems together so this has got huge potential because we can really reduce the cost we can reduce spread risk uh, we can uh, we can have a cost of production less and 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 overall farm income can really just go up so this is where then this would be I mean, this type of uh, i think integration is also very good very more useful for the small and marginal farmers because there the cost of cost of production comes down then also that you see many of because you are using the waste from one as the input to the other so that way purchase cost becomes less because just you are you depend less on external or purchased inputs so that is uh, that is important now <clears throat> the second uh, this is uh, one is okay we have done the second one is potential of uh, small holders a uh, small holding a uh, small holder farmers uh, just for example i would like to say that uh, in india also that our average is average size of farm size in india it is 1.6 hectare average farming size while in africa also it is the same sorry in in india it is 1.15 and latin america 67 western europe 27 and north america it is 121 but our size is 1.15 you can understand and 90% of our farming households they have this that is this is the holding size for them so you can understand that you see such a large number of producers are there it is not only producer they also depend for their livelihood and also for food security on 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 agriculture and whatever they contribute they do it is largely contributing to the say your uh, rural economy and <clears throat> uh here um, uh although just we have a small farmer but i i could see i could understand i don't know it might not be very true but i see that now the focus is less on small and marginal small har marginal farmers but uh, like uh, for aquaculture i see that many people are coming now new entrants they are not really traditional farmers many of them they are coming from they are entrepreneurs they are coming from say a different background so they see that you see where i can get more money and quick money so more money and quick money this you cannot get from any farming operations but uh, but something just we have in aquaculture like rs we have bioflock we have so these are intensive form of aquaculture 
where that you see certainly you get more money and then also have a quick money also but i do not know that brings only or there is something the type of subsidy we are providing that is also uh, attractant for them but while doing so i see that many of the farmers those who are those who are small farmers low cost farming they are i think that somewhere they are lagging behind now in bangladesh you see bangladesh is uh, almost one third no no one third i think it is very e e equal to one of our provinces bangladesh such a small one but they are fifth largest largest aquaculture producer and there it is mainly contribution by it, it is contributed mainly by the small farmers they have 2. Point, over 2.5 million pounds there and then uh, you can understand that you see the average production average yield for these pounds are about over 5 5.25 ton or something like that so that that is the really that is the backbone that is uh, of uh, aquaculture production second thing that these are it is completely decentralized production whatever they produce it goes to the local and uh, local and something like you see uh, national food security when when we have the high value then it goes for export but what they produce it is all go it is something like uh, only surplus are sold but it goes for the um, uh, food security so this this is uh, i i think understand that you see we should take a lesson from there and then <coughs> uh, the the other one uh, i would like to say uh, that like you know, just consider india india we have how much about uh, i think aquaculture it is 2.8 and also and uh, these are ponds and tanks 2.8 million uh, something like that and then in addition we have also oxbow lakes oxbow lake also comes there also uh, we get about 2 tons per hectare uh, so oxbow lakes are also quite about 0.8 million or something like that so quite big so if you are able to share our production average yield is 3.2 ton or 3 ton average from ponds and tanks and when we consider the ffda ponds unfortunately now we don't have F ffda but uh, you can understand that was also backbone where we can so we are not really coming with the figure that is the average production in the country it is from ffda ponds so so now it is if you consider also that average then 3.3 ton per hectare if you are able to produce our our uh, and there in bangladesh it is 5.2 if you are able to just equal them you can understand we will have 6 7 million ton uh, more production from here so alone through harnessing the potential small scale aquaculture we will be able to really significantly contribute to that one <coughs> uh, the other one i would like to i will not take much time the other one uh, that the third potential is one should also understand that you see how our farm how our extension officers extension officers are at the block level we have one people at block level we have one one person uh, extension officer there in bangladesh if we consider this, this is called a thana they have at least seven to eight people are there so but one thing is there they don't have any program of subsidy no subsidy but earlier it was all subsidy not by the government but it was <coughs> all given by the bilateral donors because they wanted to do something so them that just we are working so give them so the people it is a big attraction the people will come and they will say that okay we have been able to get benefit from you so uh, early, but when we had i have also worked in bangladesh and when we i i joined there that uh, join there means uh, that program was started we said that you see we will not give a single penny as as free in put um, cost or something any subsidy then the officers 
those who are working in the field, they said that it will not work. Your project will be doomed. Because all other Denida is there, then DFID is there, USAID. Oh, there are so many donors and they are all just to see giving them. So if you are not giving, they are not coming. But uh, we decided that we will not give because that is not sustainable. Once the project is over, there is no subsidy. Well, everything is stopped. So we said that we will not do. Then they said that how we can. But after that, well, this is not the forum for that. But, but we somehow did and demonstrated. And then many, uh, uh, many justice farmers, they started coming. And they said we will do. The, 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 I think that attraction was low cost farming, very simple farming, low cost farming, and after three to four months, they are getting their crop to sell. They can sell it. So that really helped, but some other things are also there, just we can uh, discuss later on. Or if anybody is interested, I can. So then ap after that, the project was over, then the government said, propose that you see, we want to expand this project. So they asked UNDP and also FAO. Then uh, no fund was available. FAO had a limited fund. So just to see, they, they said, OK, to certain extent, we will do. But after the completion of that, after one year, there was no fund available. Then Bangladesh government started that I, we will do from our own fund. And still, that project is continuing as a regular, they call it revenue, so it is continuing. So this is also some of the eye opening is there and there we, we can use and we can say that it is done. Now they have, uh, they have certain, uh, what is called that you see, subsidy or some support, but this is by, again, some other projects are there, bilateral donors, they provide assistance under that. So. <coughs> So these are some of those things that you see I wanted to share uh, that if it is possible, uh, we, one can try. And then, but certainly it is not that we are going to compete between in uh, say entrepreneurs and also that small farmers, no. Both of them, they can complement. Wow, yes. And the other one that the say, uh, the potential, the capacity, the strength of farmers, and also that you see, well, enterprise, social in entrepreneurs, in, in promotion of, uh, in extending of extension services system. It is not that you see our people, only one person, how just they can cover, so many farmers are there, farming households, how they can. So it is required that some sort of, so, I just give you an example in Andhra Pradesh, in Andhra Pradesh or Telangana. Between two <coughs> reservoirs, one reservoir is, uh, we discussed that there is one, one reservoir is, uh, uh, so I, I don't remember the name. So two reservoirs are there. I think it is 60, 70 kilometers apart. Yes, and these two reservoirs are the other side of the road. And this side of, uh, of the road is all land, the um, paddy fields and many, and then also, so water, these lands are being irrigated by those, those uh, uh, reservoirs, two reservoirs. So <clears throat> they have, uh, entrepreneurs has come there, and he has started, he has, he has almost, uh, say, acquired about 100 acres of uh, land area. He has developed certain infrastructure facilities, like uh, he is going to have a uh, hatch hatchery, already have, and then uh, also that feed mill, and then also he is having RAS and uh, bioflock. So he says, and he has involved some 300 farmers there, self-help group. So that gentleman alone, he has provides, he is providing training, he is providing demonstration, and he is trying to recover the cost also by giving inputs like feed and seed, and then also that is the assistance in 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 collective marketing. So that way they are recovering, and this type of system is coming. So we can understand that alone our officers they will not be able to do. 
So we, we should have these type of alternatives uh, so that uh, this, we can make use of it. So thank you, sir. I'm very <laughs> sorry that I have taken so much of time. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, again, it's very important topic, food security, nutrition security, and your vast experience in this field. So it's really thought-provoking uh, speech, sir. Thank you very much. So now I request, uh, uh, we have a, uh, Dr. M. Karthikeyan, uh, Director, MPDA, uh, is going to speak on uh, status of seafood trade and its importance in the global food security. Uh, yeah. A very good evening to all. Respected dignitaries in the dais, JS Fisheries, my dear friends. I'm just going to talk about the status of seafood trade and importance in uh, global food security. So I, I will not uh, talk much about the MPDA's role because MPDA basically plays a role in uh, promotion of the production related to exports and uh, also the quality related to the in the value chain and promote the trade across the world. So this slide talks about uh, the last year performance of the seafood trade from India. So we have been uh, exporting to more than 129 countries last year. And if you talk about the number of countries which are contributing to the maximum, only five countries we are exporting almost 70 percent, and USA is almost contributing to 33 percent. So the major item which is contributing is the frozen shrimp. So almost like 68 percent of the total export is contributed by frozen shrimp. So these are the species which are contributing for the global trade and where uh, India is uh, holding the position. So uh, shrimp is the one major species which is contributing for the global trade where we have a stake of almost 21 percent. Then we have cuttlefish, squid, some a part of crab and octopus. But the species like uh, pangasius and tilapia where we have potential but we are not able to tap because of the production cost and the scale of operation which is happening in India. But all other species where we have uh, scope for uh, uh, not the production but the processing, we have scope, but other countries are exploiting the uh, scope and by relaxation of certain norms, we will be able to tap the resources from 10 to 15, wherein we can uh, import raw material for reprocessing and export because the trade in salmon and the cart is increasing because the production is happening in the cage farming and, uh, and also from the wild catches are happening and there is being the processing is being exploited by the other countries like China or Korea. So the global Indian seafood and the uh, decadal growth, if you see, like uh, the one from 162 billion, it has grown to 189 billion uh, from two, so for, for the last five years. It is 2,162 to 190 it has grown, whereas in case of India, it is from 6.81. We have touched around 8 billion, 8.09 billion. This is like Alan Rear. Uh, wherein uh, 7.98 was the achievement. So if we talk about the products in uh, the world, actually shrimp and uh, the uh, salmon dominates, but whereas in the case of India, the frozen shrimp is uh, the dominant species which is contributing. Uh, these are the countries which are the leading importers and exporters. So if we talk about uh, the importers, the uh, U.S. imports almost like 31 billion of seafood. Almost 95 or 96 percent of the seafood which is being consumed in the U.S. is being imported by them. So China, again, almost like uh, 19 billion they are uh, importing, but uh, whereas uh, they also export the maximum in the world. So they import, they also produce, and also they reprocess and export. Japan is, again, a major uh, seafood consuming nation with almost like 15 billion uh, import. Spain, again, uh, the next. And uh, India is nowhere in the import because we do a minimum import of pangasius and some other uh, high value species for the hotel business. And exports. We are almost uh, in the fourth position, but we have now pushed into seventh position because Ecuador and uh, Russia and all have taken over our position recently. 
so the world fisheries and aquaculture production and its utilization if you see like uh, we are producing uh, like the world was producing less than uh, 110 uh, uh, mil billion worth of material and uh, the population was only around 5.7 and the consumption was on around 81.6 billion but right now the consumption in the human this one is 157.5 uh, 157.4 billion worth uh, seafood is being consumed but uh, the population growth is happening. The per capita consumption is also, if you see in the bottom, it has grown from 14.3 kg to 20.2 kg. So, if you, why I am talking about this slide is how the growth of population is happening. Uh, Lakra sir and uh, Dilip Masar is talking about the overall production increase. Sector. This is the funding pattern. I think this looks kind of boring. So, I'll just briefly explain for the central sector scheme where we give funding to the central institutes or organizations for research oriented and development activities that is 100% funding and where in the beneficiary oriented sir here we are mainly concentrating towards the small and marginal fishers wherein we give uh, the subsidy of about funding uh, like the financial assistance about 40% of the unit cost but we have given 60% of the financial assistance just encouraging the women beneficiaries and SEST and again these are only for the marginal and small farmers. These are the important activities which, which we have taken up. If you can see these are the noble activities which has been not taken up earlier. So now what makes this scheme uh, different than any other schemes is we have curated some of the important ideologies all over the world all over from the literatures, you know, to have a holistic approach through Government of India so that it has fisheries is a sustainable approach in the long run. Say uh, artificial reef, seaweed farming, you support aqua, aqua park in terms of cluster based, uh, based approach. You also support uh, uh, modern coastal fishing villages. Here, the entrepreneur model. So, the uh, other part of the subsidy were basically for small and marginal, and the entrepreneur models are if any of the entrepreneur want to come and set up a large scale business, and they are, we are not going to give them, you know, 40 or 60 percent subsidy, but to encourage them, you give a marginal amount of 20 to 25 percent assistance and also encourage them to take up training through NFDB so that they continue the project what they take up. Also for the central sector wherein the 100% assistance is provided, these are the major core activities department has identified and we have approved almost 91 uh, projects all over these activities. You can see uh, these are some of the key indicators which have been highlighted by the speakers where, you know, uh, in terms of their way forward like genetic improvement programs, strengthening of databases, disease monitoring surveillance, fish farmer producer organization, and training, technology demonstration, etc. So we have been receiving overwhelming response from all the states and uh, implementing agencies, and we have approved almost a proposal worth about 17,118 crore. This is uh, basically how you apply how the mode, because the mode of application for central sector and sponsored are different. You come through the state government for sponsored, and you directly apply to the department in central sector scheme. For more information, we have a dedicated uh, website uh, that is uh, wherein you have uh, the options for uh, guidelines in terms of both English and Hindi. You can go into the unit cost activities and the way forward how to apply. So the other two important schemes are mainly towards, you know, it will be the future of the country. Basically, you don't give much subsidy, but you encourage fisheries development. That is through financial inclusion. You have a scheme in the department that is Fisheries and Aquaculture Infrastructure Development Fund. What you basically do here is when you go for a project, you give an interest subvention of 3%. So the person who is applying uh, has uh, the bank charges about 8% of the loan. If the project is approved under the department, uh, there is a subvention of 3%, so you pay only 5% uh, for the total project. And as on date, we have approved almost 121 number of projects, and it has a maximum repayment period also of about 12 months, 12 years, sorry. So this project has ended uh, at, uh, during 2022, but because of its success and you know requests from various states and entrepreneurs, we are in the process of continuing this process, uh, this project, and we'll be intimating you all soon.
Next important is what marked the change in agricultural sector, the Kisan credit card. So this was uh, one of uh, the system which you know strengthened uh, the agriculture farmers in terms of short term credit and it was implemented to fisheries in 1819 wherein a credit uh, card of about 2 lakh exclusively for fisheries has been given which you can use for your short term credit system and you get an interest subvention of 2%. So we have almost issued about 1.49 lakh KCC. So this is how you apply and all the three uh, 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 projects you can go to your district fisheries officer or in your headquarters. Uh, say uh, I belong to Karnataka, I go to the district fishery officer of that district in Karnataka and I apply for these projects. For, for any other details, this is the toll free number, so the department will be happy to support you. Thank you. How many minutes? Thank you, uh, thank you Prithi, for the uh, short presentation. Uh, now, now, now I request uh, our uh, Honorable uh, Joint Secretary. Uh, Mera sir to hand over mementos to our speakers. Uh, starts with uh, uh, Dilip Kumar sir. Yes. Yes. I request uh, Jain Secretary sir to hand over momento to uh, Dr. W.S. Lakra sir. I request uh, again uh, to hand over the momento to Dr. Karthikeyan, Director MPDA. Once again, I request uh, hand all the moment to, to our president, seafood expert president, president or uh, Jagdish Bhai. Last but not the least, uh, we have our own uh, Prithvi Rani. Since already, no, it's fine, fine, it's fine. No, no, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> no, I ought to talk. So, since we are running short of the time, I don't think we have time for uh, question answer. Any one question you can take, anybody? Any important, anything is there? Uh, Yeah, if uh, there are no questions, uh, uh, once again, thank you very much for everybody, for your patience listening. A special thanks to our uh, Jan Secretary, sir, for his team. Yeah.